My four little children one day live in a nation where they will not be judged by the color of their skin, but by the content of their character. I have a dream today. Martin Luther King Jr. is a man that is universally praised as one of the greatest heroes of the 20th century. Every year on the third Monday in January, a national holiday is celebrated in his honor. But the truth is that Martin Luther King Jr. was a wicked false prophet, a sexual pervert, and a communist tool. This film is not about race. God has made all nations of the earth of one blood. This film would judge Martin Luther King not by the color of his skin, but by the content of his character. Martin Luther King Jr. was a false prophet because he did not believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Martin Luther King Jr. was a false prophet because he masqueraded as a Baptist pastor, yet he denied the virgin birth of Christ. Let me just read for you from his own writings. First, we must admit that the evidence for the tenability of this doctrine is too shallow to convince any objective thinker. To begin with, the earliest written documents in the New Testament make no mention of the virgin birth. The effort to justify this doctrine on the grounds that it was predicted by the prophet Isaiah is immediately eliminated. For all New Testament scholars agree that the word virgin is not found in the Hebrew original, but only in the Greek text, which is a mistranslation of the Hebrew word for young women. He's saying that Isaiah 7:14 doesn't say that a virgin shall conceive, it just says a young woman shall conceive, and that Matthew got it wrong when he said a virgin shall conceive in the Greek New Testament. All scholars agree that it doesn't say Hebrew in the Oh really? If all scholars agree that the Hebrew original does not say virgin, then why are there literally several hundred different English translations of the Bible on the market today that all say virgin in Isaiah 7, 14. The King James says virgin, and even all these modern phony versions, they all say virgin in Isaiah 7, 14. Virtually every English Bible that has ever been printed says virgin in Isaiah 7, 14. Yet Martin Luther King Jr. says, well, all scholars agree that it shouldn't say virgin there. Now, if you don't believe in the virgin birth, that leads you to not believe that Jesus is the Son of God. And therefore, Martin Luther King Jr. states later on that he doesn't believe that Jesus is the Son of God. Listen to this quote from the paper. The church called Jesus divine because they had found God in him. They could only identify him with the highest and best in the universe. It was this great experience with the historical Jesus that led the early Christians to see him as the divine Son of God. So in that quote, he's denying that Jesus is the Son of God and he's denying that Jesus is divine meaning he's denying that Jesus is God. Now look down at your Bible at 1 John chapter 5. For whatsoever is born of God overcometh the world. And this is the victory that overcometh the world, even our faith. Who is he that overcometh the world, but he that believeth that Jesus is the Son of God? We shall overcome deep in my heart. I do believe we shall overcome. Martin Luther King Jr. did not overcome according to scripture because the Bible says right here, for whatsoever is born of God overcometh the world. And this is the victory that overcometh the world, even our faith, which is something that Martin Luther King Jr. did not have. And then look at the next verse. Who is he that overcometh the world, but he that believeth that Jesus is the son of God? No, we as Bible believing Christians shall overcome. Amen. But Martin Luther King Jr. did not overcome because he did not believe that Jesus was the Son of God. Listen to what he said about the resurrection. At the age of 13, I shocked my Sunday school class by denying the bodily resurrection of Jesus. From the age of 13 on, doubts began to spring forth unrelentingly. The early Christians had lived with Jesus. They had been captivated by the magnetic power of his personality. This basic experience led to the faith that he could never die. And so when the brief scientific thought pattern of the first century, this inner faith took outward form. So he's explaining that in their unscientific minds, they came up with the resurrection of Jesus Christ because he believed in science falsely so-called. Right. 
Now, what does the Bible say about the bodily resurrection? You don't have to turn there, but in John chapter 2, verse 19, Jesus answered and said unto them, Destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. But he spake of the temple of his body. He said, destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. He was talking about his body. Therefore, the resurrection of Jesus Christ, a bodily resurrection. Amen. Of course, we could go to many other scriptures that would show the same thing. He also taught that Christianity was just one of the many religions that came about at that time and that it was heavily influenced by all the pagan religions around it. That Christianity did copy and borrow from Mithraism cannot be denied, but it was generally a natural and unconscious process rather than a deliberate plan of action. It was subject to the same influences from the environment as were the other cults. Now, if you read that quote carefully, you'll realize that he is calling Christianity a cult yeah. and saying that it borrowed from the other cults. So this man's a Baptist pastor. He was a pastor of two different Baptist churches. Then he was an assistant pastor at a Baptist church. Look, is this man a Baptist? Martin Luther King Jr.'s organization that he operated out of was called the Southern Christian Leadership Conference. Is that a fitting name for it? I mean, does this guy sound Christian? But think about what a wicked person pretends to be a Baptist pastor while openly denying that Jesus is the Son of God, openly denying the virgin birth, openly denying the resurrection, openly denying all these things. You say, well, then why be a pastor? He was only a pastor to further his political and activist ambitions. It had nothing to do with religion. It had nothing to do with being spiritual. It just had to do with giving him a platform and a soapbox to speak his message. Now, the Bible says, Woe well, unto you when all men shall speak well of you. For so did their fathers to the false prophets. The Bible's real clear. The false prophets are praised and spoken well of by the unbelieving world. Right. And the true prophets are reviled and hated of this world. Martin Luther King Jr., while masquerading as a Baptist preacher, denied every major doctrine of the Bible. He only used his position as pastor to advance his political career and activism. The Bible refers to unbelieving preachers who deny the doctrines of Christ as false prophets. According to God's word, these men not only preach lies, but they are also wicked in every other area of life. They are described in the New Testament as adulterers, sexual perverts, and ministers of Satan. These descriptions ring true in the life of Dr. King. But someone's response to this could be, well, okay, so he didn't believe the right doctrines from the Bible. So what? He was still a great civil rights leader. He was still a great man and a great speaker. He still fought for a lot of great causes. That's what a lot of people would say. Who cares about his doctrine? We're not looking to him as a pastor. We're not looking to him as our spiritual leader. We're just looking to him as a champion of political issues. And so what he believed about Jesus is not the issue. Now, here's the thing. If he were just an unsaved guy who was a great political figure, I could see where someone was coming from with that. This is a man who is a Baptist pastor. That takes him from just being an unsaved dude to being a false prophet. What the Bible says about false prophets all came true in the life of Martin Luther King Jr. And the Bible teaches very clearly that false prophets are rotten people to the core. Not just that they happen to have a few doctrines wrong, like the virgin birth and the fact that Jesus is the Son of God, but rather that false prophets are actually wicked people through and through. That's what the Bible teaches. The Bible famously says, Beware of false prophets which come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravening wolves. That's how the Bible describes false prophets. A wolf in sheep's clothing. One who inwardly is a ravening wolf. Look what the Bible says about false prophets in 2 Peter chapter 2. But there were false prophets also among the people, even as there shall be false teachers among you, who privily shall bring in damnable heresies, even denying the Lord that bought them, and bring upon themselves swift destruction, having eyes full of adultery, and that cannot cease from sin, beguiling unstable souls, and heart they have exercised with covetous practices, cursed children, 
which have forsaken the right way and are gone astray, following the way of Balaam the son of Bozor, who loveth the wages of unrighteousness. The Bible says that not only are they denying Christ and preaching damnable heresies, but that they have eyes full of adultery, that they cannot cease from sin, that they beguile unstable souls, that they have covetous practices. Go to Jude. Now the book of Jude is a parallel passage with 2 Peter chapter 2. Likewise also these filthy dreamers, the father flesh, despise dominion and speak evil of dignities. Woe unto them! For they have gone in the way of Cain, and ran greedily after the heir of Balaam for reward, and perished in the gang saying of Cory. These are spots in your feast of charity, when they feast with you, feeding themselves without fear. Clouds they are without water, carried about of winds, trees whose fruit withereth, without fruit, twice dead, plucked up by the roots, raging waves of the sea, foaming at their own shame, wandering stars, to whom is reserved the blackness of darkness forever. But other than that, he's a great guy. I mean, isn't that what people think? But this is about false prophets. How could you say other than that, he's a great guy? Well, just to remove all doubt, go to Jeremiah chapter 23 and see what the Bible says about false prophets back in the book of Jeremiah. I've heard what the prophets said that prophesy lies in my name, saying, I have dreamed, I have dreamed. I have a dream. How long shall this be in the heart of the prophets that prophesy lies? Yea, they are prophets of the deceit of their own heart. Behold, I am against them that prophesy false dreams, saith the Lord, and do tell them, and cause my people to err by their lies and by their lightness. Yet I sent them not, nor commanded them. Therefore they shall not profit this people at all, saith the Lord. So is he saying, oh, society is going to profit from this guy, even though he's a false prophet, he's teaching lies, there are other good things we can get from him? No, it says that he shall not profit this people at all. That's what the Bible says, my friend. Now, what did the Bible specifically say about false prophets that they would do, sinfully speaking? Well, he said in Jude that they would defile the flesh, even as Sodom and Gomorrah being given over to fornication and so forth. He also said in 2 Peter 2 that they had eyes full of adultery and that cannot cease from sin. Martin Luther King Jr. was a serial adulterer and a major pervert, which confirms what the Bible predicted he would be. 50 years ago this week, in November 1964, FBI Director J. Edgar Hoover told a group of reporters on the record that Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. was, quote, the most notorious liar in the country and a danger to the American way of life. And their attempts to discredit King went far beyond just calling him a liar. The FBI placed bugs in King's hotel room, tapped his phones, bugged his apartment in Atlanta. The FBI has 14 filing cabinets full of eavesdropping data on Martin Luther King Jr. 64,000 pages of this data was released to the Senate and it was labeled obscene. Not classified, but it was labeled obscene. Now this eavesdropping data showed the fact that he would go to these cities where he would have these speeches. He would hire all kinds of prostitutes and have orgies in his hotel room. A Baptist pastor the wonderful moral civil rights leader, Dr. Oh, I'm sorry, the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. was hiring prostitutes in city after city and having perverted orgies in the hotel room with these prostitutes. Today, the New York Times Magazine published for the very first time a full unredacted letter sent to King in 1964, which until now has only been available to the public with significant redactions. It's an utterly shocking document. The letter accuses King of being, quote, a filthy abnormal animal who's engaged in sexual orgies at odds with his claims to morality, with dirty, evil companions, male and female, giving expression with you to your hideous abnormalities. The truth is that it was really written by one of J. Edgar Hoover's own top men, William Sullivan, the head of the FBI's intelligence operations who, according to Tim Weiner's history of the FBI, had a package of the King's sex tapes prepared by the FBI's lab technicians, wrote the accompanying poison pen letter, and sent both to King's home. 
Sullivan's letter ends with what seems like for King, a call for King to kill himself. King, there is only one thing left for you to do. You know what it is, says the letter ominously. There is but one way out for you. You better take it before your filthy, abnormal, fraudulent self is bared to the nation. How did you find this thing? I really just happened upon it. So the letter itself has been known for about 40 years at this point, uh, but we've only seen it in these sort of redacted versions. And I was going through a new set of Hoover's official and confidential files, which were really the secret files that he kept in his office. They had been reprocessed. They had finally been turned over to the National Archives. And I was amazed to see this letter there finally with uh, all of the redactions removed. Now I've got a copy of the letter right here. This is the letter that the FBI sent to Martin Luther King Jr. In view of your low-grade, abnormal personal behavior, I will not dignify your name with either a mister or a reverend or a doctor, and your last name calls to mind only the type of king such as King Henry VIII and his countless acts of adultery and immoral conduct lower than that of a beast. No person can overcome facts, not even a fraud like yourself. Lend your sexually psychotic ear to the enclosure. You will find yourself in all your dirt, filth, evil, and moronic talk exposed on the record for all time. I repeat, no person can argue successfully against facts. You are finished. You will find on the record for all time your filthy, dirty, evil companions, male and females, giving expression with you to your hideous abnormalities and some of them to pretend to be ministers of the gospel. Satan could not do more. What incredible evilness. It is all there on the record. Your sexual orgies. Listen to yourself, you filthy, abnormal animal. You're on the record. You have been on the record. All your adulterous acts, your sexual orgies extending far into the past. This one is but a tiny sample. They sent him an audio recording with the letter. You will understand this. Yes, from your various evil playmates on the East Coast to others on the West Coast and outside the country, you're on the record. King, you are done. The American public, the church organizations that you've been helping, Protestant, Catholic, and Jews will know you for what you are, an evil, abnormal beast. So will others who have backed you, you're done. King, there's only one thing left for you to do. You know what it is. You have just 34 days in which to do it. This exact number has been selected for a specific reason. It has definite practical significance. You're done. There is but one way out for you. You better take it before your filthy, abnormal, fraudulent self is bared to the nation. So guess what happened? He didn't kill himself. So guess what they did? 34 days later, they gave it to the media. Guess what the media did? Total media blackout. No one would print it. No one would report it. This from the Washington Post by Richard Cohen. Let me just read for you this article entitled, What if the FBI had succeeded in exposing Martin Luther King Jr.? The FBI bugs of King's home and hotel rooms had become common knowledge in newsrooms around the country. But here's the thing. No one printed a word of it. Are you getting this? This article in the Washington Post is saying, isn't it so wonderful that when the FBI delivered all this smut that Martin Luther King Jr. was into to the media and said, hey, you need to expose this guy that everybody's looking up to as a great leader for the filthy pervert that he is, no one in the media would print a word of it. Now, it's not because they respected the personal lives. Of a, no, you know what it was? They were receiving orders not to print it because the media is controlled because the media is not a free press. That's why, because they were being controlled and they were not allowed to print it. That's what's really going on. But this guy says he was saved from ignominy. No, he wasn't just because people don't know about it. God knows about it. And in 2014, everybody now knows about it. He was preserved for greatness. Not in my book. I don't think that a filthy pervert and a false prophet is a great man for one second. The article goes on to say, I can't help wondering what would have happened if King would have been exposed at the time. 
The cries of hypocrisy would have blighted the sun. A minister, a civil rights leader, a married man, a father. Yeah, those are good questions. Why is this man such a hypocrite? The result would be the hideous destruction of a great man. How can you destroy a great man just by shining the light on the fact that he is committing adultery with prostitutes in every place? Well, I just don't think any of that's true. That's just a bunch of scuttlebutt. Right. Yeah, the Washington Post, the New York Times, the FBI, the Senate, they're all just creating this elaborate conspiracy theory. No, even his friends admitted it. Listen to this, Ralph David Abernathy, which is one of his fellow reverends that he ran with. He said in his 1989 autobiography and the walls come tumbling down that Martin Luther King engaged in extramarital affairs, evidence of which was sometimes recorded by the FBI through hotel room bugs. This is his buddy in the civil rights movement, Reverend Ralph Abernathy. Here's a quote from his book. I remember in particular a stay at the Willard Hotel in Washington, where they not only put in audio receivers, but video equipment as well. Then after collecting enough of this evidence to be useful, they began to distribute it to reporters, law officers, and other people in a position to hurt us. Finally, when no one would do Hoover's dirty work for him, someone in the FBI put together a tape of highly intimate moments and sent them to Martin. Unfortunately, and perhaps this was deliberate, his wife Coretta received the tape and played it first. Such accusations never seemed to touch her. She rose above all the petty attempts to damage their marriage by refusing to even entertain such thoughts. Right, that, you know, just those petty attempts, those petty attempts to hurt someone's marriage, like when you send them a cassette tape of their husband committing adultery with hundreds of different people in hotel rooms across America. You know, just little stuff like that that doesn't really matter anyway. She didn't let little stuff like that get her down. What a wonderful wife. I mean, what in the world? Sometimes I feel like I'm living in the twilight zone. Now you might ask yourself as I'm preaching this sermon, why was the FBI eavesdropping on Martin Luther King Jr.? And the answer is because of him being connected with communists. Civil rights activist Bayard Rustin served as King's main advisor and mentor in the late 1950s. He had joined the Young Communist League in 1936 and continued working with the Communist Party USA until the early 1940s. Following directions from the Soviet Union, the Communist Party USA and its members were active in the civil rights movement for African Americans. Following Stalin's theory of nationalism, the Communist Party USA, or CPUSA, once favored the creation of a separate nation for blacks to be located in the south of the United States. However, after 1941, when Germany invaded the Soviet Union, Joseph Stalin ordered the CPUSA to abandon civil rights work and focus on getting the U.S. to enter World War II. Disillusioned, Rustin began working with members of the Socialist Party instead. Rustin was a homosexual who was arrested in Pasadena in 1953 for committing sodomy in a car with two other men. He pleaded guilty to the crime of sex perversion and served 60 days in jail as a punishment. Now those were the good old days when sodomy was a crime. Yeah. Yeah. In 1953, even in California, he was arrested for sodomy. And notice, he was an advisor and mentor. I'm sorry. He was the main advisor and mentor to Martin Luther King Jr. in the late 50s. When was he arrested and convicted of sodomy? In the early 50s. When is he the main advisor and mentor of Martin Luther King Jr.? In the late 50s. So Martin Luther King Jr. has with him this known former communist and homosexual as his main mentor and advisor in the Southern Christian Leadership Conference. Another of King's most trusted advisors was a Jewish New York lawyer named Stanley Levison who was a leader of the Communist Party USA in the 1950s. Yet another of King's advisors and director of the Southern Christian Leadership Conference was Jack O'Dell. During the 1950s, Jack O'Dell was a member of the Communist Party USA. Both President John F. Kennedy and Attorney General Robert Kennedy tried to persuade Martin Luther King to separate himself from the known communists in his organization, but he would not heed the warning. 
On October 10th, 1963, Attorney General Robert F. Kennedy authorized the Federal Bureau of Investigation to begin wiretapping the telephones of the Reverend Martin Luther King Jr. Kennedy believed that one of King's closest advisors was a top level member of the American Communist Party. And look, this wasn't some right wing conservative that said, let's wiretap Martin Luther King Jr. It was Robert Kennedy. The Kennedys were liberal. And even they said, we need to wiretap Martin Luther King Jr. because of this communist connection. But they ended up getting all this smut and filth of his wickedness and adulteries. Here's what a woman named Julia Brown, who was a communist in Cleveland for nine years said, we were told to promote King, to unite Negroes and whites behind him and to turn him into a sort of national hero. We were to look to King as the leader in this struggle, the communist said, because he was on our side. While in the party, I learned that King attended a communist training school, that several of his aides were communists, and that he received funds from communists and took directions from them. He was one of their biggest heroes. Look, it's a fact. He attended the Highlander Folk School, which was a communist training school. These are facts. He was a communist. He was a pervert. He was an adulterer. He was a false prophet. But other than that, he was a great guy. <laughs> Think about that, man. It doesn't make any sense. So eventually we all know how Martin Luther King Jr. met his end. He was assassinated. The assassination was supposedly carried out by a man named James Earl Ray, but James Earl Ray never received a jury trial. Even Martin Luther King Jr.'s own family believes that he was not the killer. Martin Luther King Jr.'s son went and visited James Earl Ray in prison and walked away believing him that he was not the killer. Dexter King arrived at this Nashville prison to meet the man serving time for the death of his father, Dr. Martin Luther King. Long anticipated, uh, the youngest son wanted to look into the eyes of a terminally ill James Earl Ray and ask one question in particular. Did you kill my father? No, no, I didn't, no. And then King offered this. I believe you. And my family believes you. Dexter King, good morning to you. Good morning. Take me back to the moment when you reached out and shook James Earl Ray's hand. What was that like? It was very moving, uh, a feeling of relief to finally meet face to face with the man who has been accused, uh, but has since, uh, from the beginning, said he was innocent. I continue to hear that he confessed, and in fact, he didn't confess. He pled guilty, which is different, technically speaking. So when you asked him, did you kill my father, in no uncertain terms, and he said, no, I did not, why do you believe him? Well, I believe him because there's so much new evidence that has been presented uh, to me and my family vis-a-vis -vis his attorney, uh, Bill Pepper. Uh, also, the fact of the matter is, um, he has said from the beginning uh, he was innocent. I asked him why he pled guilty. He said basically his attorney at the time cut a deal behind the scenes with the uh, district attorney and unbeknownst to him, he uh, was forfeiting his rights to a trial. As soon as he found that out, three days later, he recanted and has since been trying to get a trial. So his defense attorney told him this, if you go to trial, you're going to be convicted and you're going to be put to death. Because if he would have been convicted in court, he would have been put to death. So they pressured him and convinced him to plead guilty and then you won't get the death penalty. You'll get life in prison instead. So that's what he did. Three days later, he regretted it, regretted it for the rest of his life, fought to try to get a jury trial. Then Martin Luther King Jr.'s own family fought to try to get him a jury trial. And they wanted him to get that jury trial. He never got the jury trial. One week after the meeting, on the eve of the 29th anniversary of the assassination, today's Matt Lauer spoke with Pulitzer Prize winning King biographer, David Garrow. You said that the scene of James Earl Ray and Dexter King shaking hands was quote, sad and surreal. Why? Yes, Matt. I think it's very sad that the King family and the King children are so uninformed of the history that they could be open to believing that Mr. Ray was not involved in Dr. King's assassination. All right, hang on for one second because joining us now is Dexter King. Dexter, good morning to you. Good morning. Mr. Garrow seems to think that you and your family members are being duped by James Earl Ray and his attorneys. What's your reaction? 
Well, I'm very disturbed by his comments that anyone in this day and age of victims' rights would suggest uh, that it is wrong for a family to in question uh, who killed their loved one. The fact of the matter is, uh, I guess I'm, I'm really not surprised because Mr. Garrow, uh, for whatever reason, uh, is doing his job. And, and frankly, he is an agent for those forces of suppression who do not want this truth to come forward. You say, well, why do you bring that up about James Earl Ray? Why is that relevant? Well, because of the fact that I believe that the reason that Martin Luther King Jr. was assassinated is because they wanted him to be a martyr that would go down in history with greatness. And if he would have been allowed to continue living, he would have ruined his own reputation because he's going around committing all this filth. And so they figure, we better take this guy out while he's at the top of his game before he gets busted with all the filth and before he does something really stupid that we can't cover for him anymore and we can't have a media blackout anymore. So I think they took him out in order to immortalize him. President Reagan signed into law a bill today creating a national holiday honoring Martin Luther King. ABC's Sam Donaldson was at the White House. The White House staged an impressive ceremony today, the president and Dr. King's widow walking into the Rose Garden together in an effort to spruce up Mr. Reagan's tattered civil rights image. The president signed the bill, which he had so strongly opposed, making Martin Luther King Jr.'s birthday a national holiday. When it was over, Mrs. King said it had been a great day, and the president's words were fitting. The Reverend Jesse Jackson, who's running for president, said it was not a day for him to criticize anyone. A national holiday was proclaimed in honor of Martin Luther King Jr. Starting on October 8th, 1983, there were debates on the Senate floor about the King holiday. And let me just point out to you the word holiday means holy day. That's what holiday means. Do we need a holy day for Martin Luther King Jr.? I mean, does this man sound like he was a holy man? And in these debates, there were, of course, people who brought out all the smud and the filth and all the 64,000 pages that the Senate had received. And then the other side basically just said, well, how dare you run this smear campaign? Just want to just ignore the facts of all this filth and smut that was proven by hard evidence. And of course, the King holiday came about. Why? Because of the fact that if you don't like Dr. King, you're a racist. And by the way, if you don't like Obama, you're also a racist. I mean, that's what these people believe, don't they? People will just try to tell you, shut up about Martin Luther King Jr., you vicious racist. I do not have a racist bone in my body. Anyone who knows me can verify that. But yet you're called a racist for criticizing Obama, for criticizing Martin Luther King Jr. We're just judging people on the content of their character, folks. Right. Nothing to do with color. People who don't have any facts want to make it about color and play that race card. Hey, now listen, I grew up in Christian school. And I went to a lot of different Christian schools, Baptist schools, and none of them ever gave us the day off for Martin Luther King Jr. Day. And we never complained about it one time. Because our parents taught us that that holiday was something that we do not observe as Christians because he was a wicked, false prophet, and an adulterer, and a communist. And when I was growing up, Martin Luther King Jr. was known in my house as Marxist Lucifer King. That's how he was referred to in my house. Marxist because he was a communist. Lucifer because he was of the devil. The Bible says that Satan's ministers are transformed into ministers of light. And no marvel. Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. Therefore, it is no great thing if his ministers also be transformed as the ministers of righteousness, whose end shall be according to their works. But today, even Baptists, even Christians have been so brainwashed by TV and media that they exalt this man whom they know nothing about just because everybody else is doing it. And the Bible says, they that forsake the law praise the wicked but such as keep the law, contend with them. Now you say, Pastor Anderson, what's the message of the sermon? What are we going to do next Monday? What's the celebration? You know who I'm going to celebrate next Monday? Jesus. Amen. 
because Jesus is the real hero of racial equality that, that we ought to be celebrating. If you want to celebrate the third Monday in every January as a day of remembering a someone who did the most to bring people together of all nations and ethnicities, you ought to be celebrating the Lord Jesus Christ. Here's what Jesus said. And of the sheep I have, which are not of this fold, them also I must bring, and they shall hear my voice. And there shall be one fold and one shepherd. And when he said that, you know what he was referring to? He said, other sheep that are not of the Jews, sheep that are of the Gentiles, I'm going to bring them. And there's going to be one fold. And there's going to be one shepherd. And my house shall be a house of prayer to all nations. Amen. And let me tell you something. The place where red and yellow, black and white can come together and have unity and be brothers and sisters is in the local church. Amen. That's where we'll be united. Amen. That's where we can come together and realize that we're all of one blood. That's where we're taught that our brother and our sisters are red and yellow, black and white because we are God's children only if we believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. The Bible says, but as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. And we are brothers and sisters in Christ today in the local church. For by one spirit are we all baptized into one body, whether we be Jews or Gentiles, whether we be bond or free, and have been all made to drink into one spirit. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither bond nor free. There is neither male nor female. For ye are all one in Christ Jesus. The Bible says, Then Peter opened his mouth and said, Of a truth I perceive that God is no respecter of persons, but in every nation he that feareth him and worketh righteousness is accepted with him. Amen. That's the answer tonight. We don't need Martin Luther King. You say, well, if we don't have Martin Luther King you know, then basically all the blacks are going to go back into slavery and we're all going to be segregated and everything. We don't need Martin Luther King. You know what that movement should have done is lifted up Jesus as their leader. And they should have made these Bible verses their slogan and chanted these slogans and said, we shall overcome by believing that Jesus is the son of God. Amen. That's how we're going to overcome the race problem is when we realize that we're all related through Christ because we believe in Jesus. And you know what? I have a lot more in common and I have a lot more fellowship and I have a lot more affection for my brothers and sisters in Christ, no matter what their nationality, than even my flesh and blood relatives that are not saved. I'm not going to stick together with the white people. You know, we white people need to stick together. We black people need to stick together. We Hispanics need to stick No, no, no. I'm sticking together with God's people. Yeah. Amen. That's, right. That's where my loyalty is. My loyalty is to Jesus and to his children. That's right. And nationality means nothing. Amen. Do not be deceived, my friend. Many deceivers are entered into the world who confess not that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh. This is a deceiver and an antichrist.
No, the Bible's really clear on salvation. It's not based on how good you are. A lot of people think they're pretty good, you know, and yeah, they're going to get to heaven because they're pretty good. But the Bible says, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. The Bible says, that is it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. I'm not righteous, you're not righteous. And if it were our goodness that would get us into heaven, none of us would be going. Because the Bible even says in Revelation 21, 8, it says, but the fearful and unbelieving and the abominable and murderers and sorcerers and whoremongers and idolaters, and listen to this, and all liars shall have their part in the lake which burneth with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. I've lied before. Everybody's lied before. So we've all sinned, and we've done stuff worse than lying, let's face it. We all deserve hell. But the Bible says, but God commanded his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. And so Jesus Christ, because he loves us, came to this earth. The Bible says he was God manifest in the flesh. God basically took on human form. He lived a sinless life. He did not commit any sin. And of course, they beat him and spit on him and, and nailed him to the cross. The Bible says that when he was on that cross, he himself bare our sins in his own body on the tree. So every sin you've ever done, every sin I've ever done, it was as if Jesus had done it. He was being punished for our sins. And then, of course, they took his body when he died. They took his body and buried it in the tomb. And his soul went down to hell for three days and three nights, Acts 2.31. Three days later, he rose again from the dead. He showed unto the disciples the holes in his hands. And the Bible's really clear that Jesus did die for everybody. It says that he died not for our sins only, but also for the sins of the whole world. But there's something that we must do to be saved. The Bible says, it has that question in Acts 16, what must I do to be saved? And they said, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved in thy house. And that's it. He didn't say join a church and you'll be saved, get baptized and you'll be saved, live a good life and you'll be saved, repent of all your sins and you'll be saved. No, he said believe. And even the most famous verse in the whole Bible that's written on the bottom, I mean, the, the reference is written on the bottom of the cup at In-N-Out Burger. I mean, it's so famous. Everybody's heard of it. John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. And everlasting means everlasting. It means forever. And Jesus said, I give unto them eternal life and they shall never perish. Neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. The Bible says in John 6, 47, Verily, verily, I say unto you, He that believeth on me hath everlasting life. So if you believe on Jesus Christ, the Bible says you have everlasting life. You're going to live forever. You can't lose your salvation. It's eternal. It's everlasting. Once you're saved, once you believe on him, you're saved forever. And no matter what, you can never lose your salvation. Even if I were to go out and commit some awful sin, God will punish me for it on this earth. If I went out and killed somebody today, you know, God's going to make sure I get punished. I'm going to prison or, or far worse or the death penalty. Whatever this earth punishes me and God's going to make sure I get punished even more. But I'm not going to hell. There's nothing I can do to go to hell because I'm saved. And if I went to hell, God lied because he promised that whoever believeth in him has everlasting life. And he said, whosoever liveth and believeth in me shall never die. That's why there are a lot of examples of people in the Bible who did some really bad stuff, yet they made it to heaven. How? because they were so good? No, it's because they believed on the Lord Jesus Christ. Their sins are forgiven. Other people who may have lived a better life in the world's eyes, or maybe even really they lived a better life, they don't believe in Christ. They're going to have to go to hell to be punished for their sins. And let me just close on this one thought. One thing that I wanted to be sure and bring up today is that there was a question that was asked to Jesus by one of his disciples. And that question was this, are there few that be saved? That's a good question, right? I mean, are most people saved? Or is it few that are saved? Now, who here thinks that most people are going to heaven? Most people in this world are going to heaven. Yeah, guess what the answer was? He said, in Matthew 7, for example, he said, enter ye in at the straight gate. He said, because wide is the gate and broad is the way that leadeth to destruction, and many there be which go in thereat, because straight is the gate, and narrow is the way which leadeth unto life, and few there be that find it. And then he went on to say this. He said, Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. Many will say to me in that day, 
Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name, and in thy name have cast out devils, and in thy name done many wonderful works? And then will I profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. And so you see, there are people out there. First of all, the majority of this world doesn't even claim to believe in Jesus. Thankfully, the majority of this classroom claims to believe in Jesus. Okay, But the majority of the world does not claim to believe in Jesus. But God warned that even amongst those who claim to believe in Jesus, even amongst those that call him Lord, many will be saying to him, what about all our, we did all these wonderful works. Why aren't we saved? He's going to say, depart from me. I never knew you. That's, why, that's because salvation is not by works. And if you're trusting your own works to save you, if you think you're going to heaven because you've been baptized, or if you think you, well, I think you have to live a good life. I think you have to keep the commandments to be saved. I think you have to go to church. I think you got to, you know, turn from your sins. You know, if you're trusting in your works, Jesus is going to say to you one day, depart from me. I never knew you. You have to have all your faith in what he did. You have to put your faith in what Jesus did on the cross when he died for you, he's buried and rose again. That's your ticket into heaven. If you're trusting all the things, oh, I'm going to heaven because I'm such a good Christian and I do all these wonderful things. He's going to say, depart from me. And notice what he said. Depart from me, I never knew you. Not I used to know you. Because once he knows you, remember I mentioned this earlier, it's everlasting, it's eternal. Once he knows you, you're saved forever. But he's going to say, depart from me, I never knew you. Because if you go to hell, it's because he never knew you. Because once he knows you, he knows you. It's just like my children will always be my children. You know, when you're born again, when you're his child, you'll always be his child. You may be the black sheep of the family. You know, you may be uh, somebody who gets disciplined by God heavily on this earth. You can screw up your life down here, but you can't screw that up. You know, you're saved. It's a done deal. And so that's the main thing that I wanted to present to you about the end times. And we do have just a few minutes for uh, questions about either uh, salvation or about the end times.